Raised with a hard work ethic, which she honed with a will of steel, April Holmes has redefined what it means to be disabled. April was involved in a train accident in 2001 that resulted in the loss of her left leg below the knee. While she lay in the hospital bed, a doctor told her about the Paralympic Games and three goals were firmly implanted in her mind. She desired to wear the USA uniform. She wanted to break world records. She was determined to win gold medals. Since her career in Paralympic track and field began in 2002, April has continued to succeed improving each and every step of the way. Over her career, April has, was honored to wear the USA uniform at every major championship between 2002 and 2016. She has achieved several undefeated seasons, broken IPC world records 14 times and American records 18 times in the 100, 200, and 400 meters and the long jump. Won three Paralympic medals and won five world championship medals. With a commanding lead over the growing field of competitors, April captivated track enthusiasts with her grace and style. Off the track, April runs the April Holmes Foundation a nonprofit organization assisting people with physical and learning disabilities with scholarships and medical equipment. Having completed her MBA in marketing, April uses her education to improve the awareness of people with disabilities. April has been named one of the International Paralympic Committee's top 10 women in Paralympic sport, was the NCAA 2015 Inspirational Athlete of the Year, served as the U.S. Anti-Doping Ambassador, has assisted First Lady Michelle Obama on the Let's Move campaign, and recently spoke at the United Nations Sport and Social Impact Summit. It is my distinct honor to welcome April Holmes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I scared you all, huh? <laughs> the gunshot on the track is a little different than the gunshots we've been hearing around our nation lately, so I can understand why you all might just be a little startled. So my apologies, it's a track and field thing. I thought it was a thing up here. Um, hmm. I'm trying to hide my, uh, not really hide, but put it somewhere. Okay, so here we are. How y'all doing today? Good. You sure you good? Yes. Are you full? Yes. Sounds like you're full. I'm like, how you doing today? Good. Words come through your throat, not your belly, but sometimes if your belly's a little full, it doesn't sound like the words are coming out your mouth, right? <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, one of the promises I made to God a few years ago um, was that if he gave me the strength, the courage, the place, to win a gold medal, um, I would take it where I went. I would show people. I would pass it around. Um, but a lot of it is not about, it's not about me and not about being, me being celebrated um, as much as it is, it is to spark something within you. 
Um, so often I go places and speak and I hear people say, well, I've never touched a gold medal, I've never held a gold medal, I never thought I would be in this place to be able to hold a gold medal. Um, and while this is about my gold medal journey in my life, um, as you hold it in your hand, I want you to think about your gold medal moment in your life. Um, and hopefully that might spark something within you uh, to get you to go and get in some starting blocks and um, if a gun needs to go off, a track and field gun that is needs to go off, um, for you to start running your life, then I want you to think about those things as it's handed to you. So we're going to do our best to get it around the room in the 20 minutes left I have to speak. Um, but if you don't happen to receive it, um, then you come see me afterwards or either um, you can blame it on the person I started with. Okay? <laughs> All right, cool. Who not going that way. I'm going this way. Sir, would you like to start? Or shall we start in the back? Who wants to start? So, person in the back, raise their hand quickly. Come on, man. No, wait, ma'am. I got her coming. You going to take it to her? Oh, that's so nice of you. What's your name? Liz. Do you steal? <laughs> you steal. No, 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 no. You had to ask somebody else if you steal? <laughs> I don't know about Liz. She said, do I steal? Do I steal? No, no, no. Liz, you don't know if you're stealing or not? I don't like to steal what? Steal what? <laughs> Listen, all we're talking about is gold medals here right now. <laughs> Listen, if you stole some cake or something when you was a kid, I don't have nothing to do with that. But if you, I just want to know, do you steal now? Like, do you go I'm not going to steal anything, I promise. Okay, all right. All right. Where you live? Birmingham, Alabama. I'm not coming well, there, but y'all have police officers that I can come find you. There we okay. go. Thank you so much. <laughs> In 2001, I heard five words that changed the course of my life. Those five words were, did you get her leg? Again, those five words were, did you get her leg? I heard those five words as I was being loaded into an ambulance. I heard those five words at the, after I had spent 17 minutes being trapped underneath of a train. You see, my boyfriend and I, we were on a train, a platform very similar to this, and we were in Philadelphia, we were headed to New York. And I was standing on the platform, and the train comes, and people go to get on the train, and as I, as I got ready to get on the train, I happened to be the last person to get ready to get on the train. But as I got ready to get on the train, the driver decided that he was ready to go. So without shutting the doors, without ringing a bell, he moved the train. So I ended up slipping and falling. I fell underneath the platform, face down, with the train actually crushing my leg. I laid there for 17 minutes. Those 17 minutes seemed like the longest 17 minutes of my life because I was laying there just thinking about if I was going to live. I laid there thinking about whether or not I was going to die. If I was gonna see my family again. If this was in fact the very last chapter of the book of life of April Holmes. And as I laid there, I kept saying to myself, how in the world did I get here? Me asking myself those questions didn't help me any, but instead I, I turned and I said to myself, I said, listen, you have to figure out a way to occupy your mind. So as a kid, my mom would always tell me stories about, hey, you know, I keep you busy so you can stay out of trouble. So this was a moment that I was in trouble and I needed to keep my mind occupied. So I began thinking about things that I used to do as a kid, things that brought me joy, things that were just fun to me. And so the first thought that came to my brain was around how I used to go outside in, in New Jersey in the wintertime and I used to have snowball fights with my friends. And so I looked and there just happened to be some snow in very close proximity. So I reached over and I took a ball of snow and I made a snowball and I began throwing snowballs. All the while behind me, the paramedic unit and the engineers are still trying to figure out how to free me from this train. And then I said, okay, I, I did a good job of keeping my mind occupied, but how in the world can I keep my heart beating? So I began thinking about songs. I, I love music, so I began thinking about the beat of songs and songs that I like, songs that were more upbeat. And as I laid there thinking about songs, I, I said to myself, if I, can, if I can get my heart to keep beating to the beat of the song, then I know, I just know I'll still be alive when they move me from this train. So after a while, between the, the mind being occupied, between the, the heart being occupied, I, I, I turned to the paramedic woman and I said to her, I said, listen, um, what are they doing? And she said, oh, I, you know, they're trying to lift up this here train. And I said, can you do me a favor, please? I said, can you ask them if they can just start the train up, if they can back the train off my leg, because the sooner they can do that, then we can get to the hospital. 
she looked at me kind of strange, and I, I, I can just imagine in her brain she's saying to herself, okay, she's stuck underneath the train, but yeah, she's giving us orders about what to do about this train that's on her leg. <laughs> so she relayed the message. And I heard her relay the message. And then all of a sudden I heard the train start up. I said to myself, you got to brace yourself because in a few seconds, this train is actually going to do exactly what you wanted it to do, and that is back up off your leg. And as I'm telling myself that, I'm all, all of a sudden I began smelling the fumes of that same train. And then I felt it. I felt the train move off my leg. And then before long, they flipped me over, they put me on a stretcher, they loaded me into the ambulance, and that's when I heard those words. Did you get her leg? I thought to myself, I must be crazy. I've had my leg all my life. But I woke up a few hours later only to realize that they weren't crazy. That that was my now reality. That I no longer had a left leg. And my first thoughts was that I was not... I was not devastated by the fact that I didn't have my leg, but I was more devastated by the fact that I would never be able to run or play basketball again. In fact, I kept asking my cousin who was sitting at, my, at my, the side of my bed, I said, what happened to my leg? And she kept saying to me, you'll be okay. I asked her this question three times. I said, what happened to my leg? You'll be okay. What happened to my leg? You'll be okay. What happened to my leg? You'll be okay. I turned and I said, but I can't run or play basketball anymore. She said, it'll be okay. <laughs> so fast forward two weeks. The doctor that did my emergency surgery, he came in and he gave me some magazines about the Paralympics. That was a very pivotal time in my life and in my, in my recovery because I be, began questioning my worth. I began questioning like, if I had any value to myself, if I had any value to my family, if I had any value to my community, if I even had any purpose here on earth anymore. And so when he handed me the magazines, the doctor handed me the magazines at first, I thought he was crazy. But then I began flipping through the pages. And as I flipped through the pages, I came up with three dreams. Because as I'm looking through these pages, I see all these people that are athletes, they're doing sports, they're doing track, they're doing basketball. Two things that I thought I couldn't do anymore. And then I saw her, I saw her. I've been an athlete all my life, so I have a habit of, I'm just competitive by nature, right? So I'm flipping through the book and I'm trying to figure out, okay, who's the person I have to beat? What does she look like? What in the world is she, how tall is she? What her leg look like? I'm asking myself all these questions as I'm going through these pages. And then it didn't matter anymore about what she looked like. Instead it was about how do I get a leg? How do I go from the, Hospital, I mean from the train tracks to now the hospital bed to what is my next dream? My next dream was I wanted to represent the United States at the Paralympics. I wanted to be the fastest amputee in the world and I wanted to win gold medals. So again from the train tracks to the hospital bed to now dreaming of standing on the podium in front of the world. Two weeks, two weeks. So I tell you that whole story of, about my journey of dealing with this train because I wanna share with you all that I'm so sure that each and every one of you all here in this audience have experienced train track moments in your life. No, you may not have necessarily been trapped underneath of a train, a physical train, but in fact, you spent at some point in time during your life, you spent some time being trapped underneath of something that you could not free yourself from. You couldn't move this thing out your way, whether it was a person, whether it was a situation, whether it was employment, whether it was health, whether it was whatever. You could not move this thing out of your way to get to where you would like to go in your life.
your body, anybody. <laughs> Got another slide that I would like to move. Anyway. <laughs> so sometime in your life you were stuck in this situation. You were stuck in a situation where you just wanna, you just wanna move, you just wanna go, you just wanna be, you just wanna achieve something, but yet, and still, something is standing in your way. Something is holding you back. Something is prohibiting your movement from where you currently are to where you would like to be. I can think of so many instances. Thank you so much. Um, it's not quite the slide, but thanks. <laughs> there we go. So I think to, I think to myself that... It, had I, had I sat there in the train, had I not began to occupy my mind, had I not begun to figure out how to occupy like, my heart, had I not been thinking about keeping my heart beating at the same time, I wonder where I would be. And then I wonder about those things that have been train tracks to you, that have been trains to you in your life. I'm wondering if you'll share some of these things with us, with the rest of us. What can you think of in your life that has been a train track moment? That a train has literally kept you down. What can you think of? No one? Bueller? Not being able to find a job. Okay, unemployment. Yep. Yes, ma'am. I didn't hear that. An abusive mother. Abusive mother, yes, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Terminal diagnosis, 25 years ago. That is a blessing. Who else? Over here. I know all the people over here got something to say. What about y'all, folks? Yes, ma'am. Suicidal kid. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sexual assault. Sexual assault. Yes, sir. Being closeted for sexuality. Awesome. Awesome. The reality of it is we're still here. Give yourself a pat on the back. You're still here. Pat on the back. No? Nobody? Anybody? Somebody? Everybody? Pat on. We are still here. That train didn't define us. That train didn't destroy us. Instead, the train gave us strength. We didn't think we was going to make it out of that situation. Some of us are still dealing with those very same situations that were just announced around here. Some of us are still dealing with those today. Some of us are still dealing with these things today. But it's about getting your mind right. It's about getting your heart right. And making a determination that this situation is not going to destroy you. That this situation is not going to destroy you. So I like to say that we're always in three stages in our life. We're either getting ready to go under a train. We either just left from underneath of a train. Or either we're presently stuck underneath of a train. So you have to ask yourself, what state are you in? What state are you in right this second? Because the second you show yourself that you can make it from one train, all of a sudden the next train doesn't seem as difficult. I had a friend of mine the other day, she, she had cancer years ago and she beat cancer and she said to me, she said, she, now she has to get surgery on an ACL or MCL or some ICL. Um, and so she said to me, she's like, April, I don't know what I'm gonna do, I'm thinking I'm gonna die. I said, from your MCL to ACL? I hear more stories about the cancer part that you made it through already than the ACL and the MCL stuff. Most you might do is lose a leg. She's like, don't laugh and joke about that. <laughs> well, I mean, and listen, you've been through worse. You've been through worse. You've been through worse. So it's how do I figure out how to occupy my mind so I get out of trouble? How do I figure out how to occupy my heart And then how do I figure out how to dream and get to the next level? How do you figure out those things? When I was in uh, rehab, one of the things that I, um, I, uh, I was, was very adamant about rehab because I wanted to learn how to walk. When I walked in the door and met my therapist, I said, I want to learn how to walk so that if I have long pants on, no one will be able to tell that I'm an amputee. 
So I don't want to walk with a limp. I want to learn how to walk properly. From moment one, I want to learn how to walk properly. So whatever it takes, however long it takes, fine with me. So he says, okay, April, I'm up for the challenge. So he comes and he gives me this, um, he said, you, you put your leg on. You know, you just got your leg, put, put your leg on. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna meet you outside. Um, but just put your leg on, I'll meet you in the hallway. I said, okay, no problem. So I come out in the hallway and he says, okay, here. So he gives me a, 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 a walker, he hands me a walker. And he says, okay, so I want you to walk from here to there with the walker. I just wanna see, you know, evaluate you, see where we are. I said, okay, no problem. So I take a few steps and as I'm taking a few steps, all of a sudden he says, Miss Holmes, stop for a second. So I said, okay, why are we stopping? So he says, well, I noticed that I gave you a walker, but you're not using the walker. I said, you're right. So he said, well, I'm just curious, why are you not using a walker? I said, three reasons. I said, one is I'm too young. <laughs> Two is that I'm too cute. <laughs> and three is that I am way too sexy to be walking down the street with a walker. So he's like, hmm. Huh. Okay, well, you stand right there, I'll be right back. So he goes in this closet thing and comes back out and he pulls out this uh, four-prong cane. You all know what a four-prong cane is? Okay, cool. So he comes back to the four-prong cane. He said, okay, Ms. Holmes, um, I need you to take a few steps down the hallway with this four-prong cane. I said, sure, no problem. I got you. Take a few steps. All of a sudden, he stops me again. He said, Ms. Holmes. I said, yes, sir. I said, I noticed that you're really not using the four-prong cane either. I said, you know what? You're right. So he said, well, well, why are you not using a four-prong cane? I said, three reasons. <laughs> I'm too young. I'm too cute. I'm too sexy to be walking down the street with a four-prong cane. So he said, okay, Miss Holmes, okay, okay. He said, I, I, I'll be right back. So he goes in the closet, he comes back, and he pulls out a regular cane. So he hands it to me, and he said, okay, Miss Holmes, now, you know, see this hallway here, I want you to take you know, several steps down the hallway because, again, I'm trying to figure out you know, where you are, like you know, if you need some additional skills and like those type things. I'm trying to plan your therapy. I said, okay, great, great description. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to do exactly what you told me to do. And so I took some more steps down the hallway, and before long, he stopped me again. So I said, well, why did you stop me now? He said, because I noticed you're not using the cane either. And I said, you're right. So he said, well, Miss Holmes, why are you not using a cane? I said, three reasons. <laughs> Y'all know what three reasons are, right? <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> You're absolutely correct. I had, at that moment in time, I had Despite the fact that I knew I had spent some time underneath of a train, that's 17 minutes. Despite the fact that I knew I had spent 17 minutes underneath of a train. Despite the fact that I, I doubted if I would ever be able to run or play basketball again. Despite the fact that I had to go through therapy. Despite the fact that I still was questioning my worth. I still believed in me. I still had standards. I still believed in me. And it took a walker. It took a four-prong cane. It took a regular cane for me to announce to the world that I'm too young, too cute, and too sexy to be going through what I'm going through. So I'm curious, if you all spent 17 minutes being stuck in a situation, what three things would you come out with that you are too whatever to be whatever? They were just my three. And I have no problem telling people they were my three. Might be vain, I don't care, I'm missing my leg, I can say that. <laughs> but I could look myself in the mirror every single day and say, you are too young, too cute, too sexy to be destroyed by a train. You are too young, too cute, too sexy to be destroyed by a train. I am too young, too cute, too sexy to be destroyed by a train. You are whatever ever and whatever to be destroyed by that train in your life. Whether it be abusive parents, whether it be unemployment, whether it be cancer, whether it be sexuality, whether it be whatever. 
you make it up in your mind, if you make it up in your heart, that you are going to get up regardless, that you are not going to be defined by that situation, then I bet next year you'll stand on this stage and you'll have a story to tell. And if it's not this stage, make your own stage. If it's not this stage, build your own stage. If it's not this stage, find your own stage. Because so often in life, people will try and define you from what you've been through. So often in life, people will say to you that they don't believe that you are deserving of said thing in life. So often in life, people will not think you don't have the ability. People will think that you don't have uh, the, the uh, economic background to do such. People will think you didn't come from the right side of the train tracks. People will think you didn't come from the right neighborhood. People will think that you are not part of the right religion. What in the world does that have to do with the fact that you need to get up every single day? And despite what people think about you, that you will use those three things as motivation to do whatever it is that you want to do in your life. I like to say you can't teach hunger. You can't teach hunger. You ever try to teach somebody how I felt to be hungry? Not possible. You see, when you're hungry, there's, there's something that's deep down inside of you, that's burning deep down inside of you that says that I am in a state right now, but that's not where I want to be. It's the hunger that drives us. It's the hunger that wakes us up. It's the hunger that says to you, despite the fact that I was stuck underneath of a train for 17 minutes, I still have goals and I still have dreams. I'm curious what your goals and your dreams are. If you just ask the paramedic woman, to move the train from off your leg. You see, everyone needs a paramedic person in their life. The paramedic person in, in your life is a person that you can go to and say, hey, by the way, there is a train on my leg. There is something that's stopping me from getting where I would like to get to. Somebody that you can talk to and say, I need help. Because if they're the right person, if you say it to the right person, then the right person is going to help you move that train because they want to see you on a podium. If you say it to the right person, that person is going to do whatever they can to move that train because they want to see you on a podium. If you say it to the right person, that person is going to do whatever they can to move that train so that you are standing on a podium. Again, I passed my medal around because I wanted it to spark something within you. You all are entrusted with young people every single day. They need, they need you to be that spark. Those young people are waiting for you to walk in that classroom, in that group, in that meeting, in that school. Those young people are waiting for you to walk in because you might be the only spark they see And they need you to be that spark. They need you to come in and light a, a flame of greatness so that all of a sudden it'll illuminate their world. They trust you because you care. But you can't care with a frown on your face. When you stand on a podium, if school is the podium for you every day, when you stand on a podium, the only, I'll say, sad things that's happening is people are crying, but their tears are joy. Athletes that stand on a podium start crying because they know what they've been through. They've been through so many train situations to stand on a podium. They went through people doubting them. They went through all, all these hours of training. They went through all these hours of whether or not I'm going to make the team or not. And now all of a sudden in front of the entire world, they have an opportunity to stand there and be recognized for getting the train off their leg and achieving something great in their life. So what will your three things be? What will be the three things that take you from the train tracks to the hospital bed, to 
to the podium? I can't answer that question for you. Something you have to go home and you have to look in the mirror and you have to think about. Might take you a whole drive home. Might take you a couple weeks. Might take you a couple months. Hopefully it don't take you a couple years. <laughs> but you have to figure out what will be your podium moment, what will be a gold medal moment in your life. And it all starts with a spark. So hopefully you are holding a gold medal or me standing in front of you for the last 24 minutes will be some sort of spark that you need to go forward and live your greatest life and be your greatest self. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You want to see if they got any questions? A question or two? Sure, sure. So I think we have quite time for a couple of questions before you all are whisk out of here and moving on to the next destination. If you all have any questions, anyone? If not, I can sit down and y'all go about your business. <laughs> we we do some. have time for a couple of questions. If anyone, uh, if anyone has a question for, for April, my mic's not on. Great. All right, go, go for it. Uh, which which hurt more, rehab or training? <laughs> um, rehab was so rehab was shorter. Um, I was not in rehab very long. Um, I guess it had something to do with me being too young, too cute, and too sexy. Um, my coach, when I got to the track, he didn't care if I was young, cute, or sexy. He just wanted me to get the workout done. Um, and the Olympic cycle is long. I mean, it's, it's four years. You know, so you sit there for four years dreaming about an opportunity, uh, whereby therapy was a time that I was able to prove myself every day. Um, so um, I'd say practice hurt a whole lot more. Um, there are many days I, I didn't like my coach. Um, but I believed in him. I believed that he knew uh, what it took to stand on the podium because he had, um, my coach was uh, Al Joyner um, for many of my years in, in athletics. He, Al Joyner, his sister's Jackie uh, Joyner Kersey, his wife was Flojo, um, and his brother is uh, Bobby Kersey, and Bobby has coached many um, Olympic gold medalists, including um, Jackie and, and Al and Flojo. So um, every time I went to practice, I mean, whatever he asked me to do, even though there were days I just didn't like him, I still did what he asked me to do because I'm like, okay, you know what it takes to win a gold medal. Like, you've seen gold medals, you won gold medals. I'm going to drink the Kool-Aid. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am? Um, in our last, I believe, keynote, we were thinking about words that we are, are driving our team this year, our one word, and for me it's mentoring. Um, having the varsity students mentor the younger students. And I was just wondering if you've had personal experience mentoring other um, women in your position or, or kids. So I've had, um, I've, I've been very fortunate that I've spent the majority of my life, um, not as of lately, but I spent the majority of my life in church. Um, right now I go to Bedside Baptist. Um, <laughs> Y'all can get that later. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy that. I enjoy I enjoy service that way right now. Um, but I've I've always been in a position to um, to to mentor other people. Um, and this is not just not I'll say not even just young people younger than me. Um, in a lot of instances, I've also mentored people that are older than me. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, I'm I'm in a process of hopefully establishing a, like a, a broader mentoring program. And then just about a year ago, um, I actually went to school to uh, learn how to uh, do coaching. So I do executive coaching. And as a result of that, I've learned how to better mentor through the, through the asking of questions. Um, in a lot of ways, I've, the way I was taught mentoring or, or the way I rendered mentoring uh, was more so about telling people what to do. Um, and so as a result of learning the coaching profession and, and you know, th those type of things, I've learned the art of asking great questions. So I think that's one of the greater things that I've learned, and, and hopefully if I can impart that wisdom upon you, of, you know, let's ask questions instead. So questions help us better communicate what we're thinking and what the young person is thinking. 
Yes. Someone else I saw raise their hand in that area. Oh, okay. All right, cool. I'm pretty good like that. Well, let's give April a big round of applause. Thank you so much for being here today.